All right, thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome again to your monthly business mentorship program, Time with the Captain's Life here on TV3. My name is Parkus Yasari. Uh, let me quickly introduce to you our special guest for the month of July. So our guest is an experienced businessman with uh, over 30 years of extensive practical involvement in the construction, mining, and equipment rental business, both in West Africa and Europe. He has developed a very strong worldwide network of heavy equipment suppliers, operators, financiers, and a wide range of mining professionals. He has also developed considerable negotiating skills uh, with which the corporate interests um, has been promoted in governmental, NGO, community, and other stakeholder circles. Uh, these contracts have provided deep insights and driven his vision and overall leadership role in the company. His company uh, in 2015 uh, secured a $20 million contract with Pesio's mining company at Ayanfu in the upper Dencha West District of the Western Region to execute a complete mining project for the company. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me. Welcome the Chief Executive Officer of Rockshore International. Mr. Kwesi Oseofori. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Ofori, for your time. Good to have you on the program. Thank you. Mm. You look dapper. You like fashion? A bit. A bit. Yeah. I see. Yeah. So who is Mr. Kwesi Oseofori? Yeah. Kwesi Oseofori is a, a businessman. Um, involved in about five different companies here in Ghana, have outlets in about seven other countries uh, in uh, Africa. And also Which countries are these? Uh, we're talking about Mali, um, Sierra Leone, Ivory Coast, uh, Mauritania, uh, Guinea, Conakry, and of course Ghana. And what exactly do you do? Uh, we do uh, contract mining. Um, we work for the multinational mining companies. Um, we currently are working for about four companies in Ghana, uh, uh, gold uh, and uh, manganese. How was growing up like? Yeah. It was a, a different environment uh, in our time. Um, growing up in Kumasi, and uh, you know, you need to survive. And we had uh, at that time, uh, you know, not many role models, but at least you look at your peers, and you you want to have the same kind of share that they want. So you'll be doing business while schooling. Uh, I actually started working at the age of 13, you know, selling newspapers before I go to school. And uh, so I traced my, uh, my business uh, days for, uh, to that. At the age of 13? At the age of 13, yeah. Mm. Tell us about your educational background. What did you do? Where did you school? Well, uh, most of it uh, self-taught. Um, we, my father died when I was only nine years old, and uh, uh, I was the fourth, uh, uh, I mean, among six uh, siblings, and I, you know, it wasn't very, very conducive at that time, so. You had to learn. You, you had to way. learn, you know, you, you sell newspapers to pay your own fees, and stuff like that, you know, growing up, and, um, we we did a lot of uh, formal and informal things, you know, to get us moving. Yeah. What made you ever think that you could become a successful businessman? Well, uh, personally, I, if someone had told me at that time that I was going to employ a, a thousand people, uh, I wouldn't have believed it. But of course, I had my dreams. I had my dreams. I, I wanted to, to make it big. Uh, at the age of 19 or so, I was out there, uh, you know, working with people. You mean out there in the cold? Out, out there in the cold, very, very cold. I mean, 
27 <laughs> minus degrees, you know. So, but then working, studying at the same time and, you know, doing all kinds of, uh, of work, you know. For me, anything, uh, it's okay. But so, I, I read that you started actually with uh, a company named Edmark. Yes. Somewhere in 1994. Exactly, yeah. Um, Edmark is my, my first company, 1994. Um, I brought in some used equipment. At that time in, in, uh, in Europe, uh, NATO, uh, North the North Atlantic, Atlantic Treaty Organization. Exactly. Mm. They were doing a lot of changes, so they were selling most of their uh, equipment. And that yeah, was. And which were heavy duty equipment. Uh, yeah, exactly. Mm. That was where I really uh, uh, made my first million, you know, because uh, I was buying these machines almost for. For nothing? For, uh, yeah, for nothing, and selling it to other countries in Africa and Ghana. So, 1994. When I was coming to Ghana, uh, my first time here, I brought in about 27 pieces of equipment to start Edmark with, with the kind of um, rentals and also using for my own uh, uh, road construction. Yeah. So how did Edmark transition to Rockshaw International? Yeah, uh, as fate may, may have it, uh, I went to... Um, uh, U.S. We have this uh, the most biggest uh, heavy equipment uh, auctions that is being uh, conducted every year in February, and uh, I met this young American guy who uh, expressed interest in working with me, uh, having business with me. So uh, we, we started working together. We brought in some equipment, um, you know renting it to the mining companies. But those were just smaller uh, machines. But how would you ever think that buying, and buying equipment and bringing them to Ghana would rip your benefits? Who gave you that idea? Well, uh, at that time, in the 90s, mid-90s, equipment were very, very hard to come by. So my kid brother, who... Uh, uh, I mean, who had then uh, uh, come to Ghana for holiday told me that uh, if I could bring in one grader, and uh, to me, grader was something big, you know. So <laughs> when he told me this, and I said, wow, let me ask some of my friends here. So I asked them, and they said, oh. So when I, fo I found out that the real prices weren't that much, and I said, okay, let me go in. That was at the same time you had this NATO thing coming up. So, uh, so I took a chance. I mean, so sometimes, you know, business, you have to take a risk. Yeah, and I did that. And uh, I mean, I succeeded. So you started business in 19, active business active in, in business, 1994. Yeah. Um, do you just tell me about how that transitioned to uh, Rockshaw International? Yes, um, Rockshaw came about when the, we started with this rental uh, business and then um, we then move on to the, the mining itself. We just wanted to try it. So at that time, my partner, my then partner, was very, very eager to, to, to uh, uh, you know, make it big also. He, is, he was, at that time, as crazy as, <laughs> as I was, you know, because we wanted to, you know, make it big. And he came in with uh, about $5 million worth of equipment, and uh, I also had mine, and then, we formed uh, Rockshaw International. He was act actually he was the 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 I mean the biggest uh, shareholder at that time. Yeah, and this was which year? That was uh, 2000, and um, we formed Rockshaw 2009. Uh, so it's 10 years uh, now. And what does Rockshaw do? Rockshaw is actually doing uh, contract mining, and uh, we we have uh, about four active areas that we're working on. But we've worked also in Mauritania. We worked in uh, Mali. Uh, our contract in Mali was about three, three and a half years. But there, they have this uh, uh, local content, you know. There, if you are not a local guy, it's very difficult to really uh, get into their, uh, their system. Mm. I'm going to come back to the issue of local content back here in Ghana. But do you have any practical training 
or knowledge in, in mining? No, I'm a businessman. So how on earth does a man who doesn't have any formal education, mm -hmm. you know, be it in, you know, in, in, in equipment or in mining, yeah. get into active mining business, employing over a thousand people and still succeeding at it? Do you have any magic wand? Yeah, I think business is an art. Business, uh, you don't need, you know, you don't, I mean, you don't need to be a pilot, I mean, to run a, an airline company. What do you I, need? I, I, mean, I mean, if you're a businessman, you, you can, you know, because the skills are there. I believe in the Ghanaian. We have one of the best um, mining engineers in Africa. And uh, my, my instincts tell me that, look, other people have it. They have the knowledge. You as a businessman, to me, business is just like any other thing. Like the tomato seller in, uh, uh, at Makola, you know, he buys uh, tomatoes and he knows how to go about it. And for me, um, uh, my main point here is that uh, if you're a businessman, you can, uh, you know, buy the skills in the market. Wow. Uh, yeah. So you have people who, who have the knowledge. So you, you're more of a leader. Is that it? You're a leader? Well, I don't want to blow my own horn, uh, but uh, I, <laughs> I believe that uh, in any field, being it uh, medical, being it uh, transport or whatever, uh, once we get the, the right people with the skills, I, one thing about me is that I allow the professional to do their work as professionals, and I sit back. That's all. Please put your hands together for him. <laughs> so, growing up, okay. what, do you, what, what useful lessons have you picked up as being the... Okay, so we read books about five ways to become successful mm -hmm. and all those things. Is there any formula for being a successful yeah. businessman? Yes. Yes, I think, again, I say business is an art. It's something that you sit back, you, you guys don't shoot in the, uh, uh, in the dark. You're saying not everybody can be a businessman? I don't think so. Not everybody can be a businessman. It's not something that everybody can do, no. You can be the best. I'm a physician, you can be the best, I'm a lawyer, you can be whatever. But to be a businessman, it takes certain... Uh, uh, Is it a God-given talent? Yes. Yes. You and don't I need believe, to go to school? No, of course you have to go to school. Yes. I mean, you have to go to school. You have to learn. I mean, you don't have to be a little education. No, you have to go to school. But my point is that going to school doesn't make you a businessman. You understand? That you can be a businessman at the same time also have all the education, yes. But um, a businessman is a different field altogether. You need to be a crazy, some, uh, crazy man sometimes, to take certain risks sometimes. And uh, you see that uh, if you bring the book and you always calculate everything to the, to the last point, Sometimes you won't take that kind of risk or so. The, difficult for mo the difficulty for most people is not raising that, you know, initial capital to start a business. And we know that back here in yeah. Ghana, you know, money is quite expensive. Yeah. Very much expensive. Yeah. So how did you raise that capital, that initial capital, to be able to procure equipment for yourself? Yeah, I was in Ghana then at that time. And uh, it's an opportunity that came. Uh, opportunity that... Uh, Normally, uh, you know, when it comes, it, it doesn't come the second time. You need to take it. As I said, my brother told me about this greater thing, and then we found out that even my uh, one-month salary or two-month salary could buy that greater at that time. So I didn't need a huge capital to go into it. It was an opportunity. At that time, we, uh, I mean, you had the NATO I mean, selling their things almost for nothing, you know. So you could just, you know, buy it for, I mean, almost for nothing. Didn't yeah. you have friends coming to support you? Well, I quite remember um, 1994 when I bought those machines, I had my uh, estimates for the shipping from 
uh, Rio to, to, um, to Ghana. Then when we send this equipment to the port, you realize that the, 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 the cost, the no, no, not the duty, the, the shipping was about twice uh, uh, that price, of mine. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, a friend of mine in Holland uh, said, oh, I'm going to uh, build a house in Ghana. And uh, that this was, but I know that you need this money. I'm giving you all this money. At that time, it was about 27,000 girders, Dutch girders. I'm giving you this money. I mean, any time you get that uh, money, I mean, you build the house for me. I'm soon going to be going to my audience to take some questions from them. But, you know, what you just said brings me to, brings me back to the question of friends. Yes. What kind of friends do you need around you in the road to success? Yeah, you need friends who can, but uh, I mean, it also depends on you. You need to build some kind of trust. For somebody to tell you, this guy had then lived in Europe for about 19 years, and he had this money, he wanted to come and build his house in Ghana. And he said that, oh, you need it, I'm giving you that money. Whenever you are ready, build a house for me. It's not just uh, a matter of, not any other friend can do that, you know. And he got, it was his life at that time. And when I came, and I, built, I built a big house for him, bigger than my own house. You did? I, I did. I did. Bigger than my own house. Because without that help, I don't think I'll be sitting here giving this testimony. A round of applause, ladies and gentlemen. We're still watching Time of the Captain's Live here on TV3, a monthly business mentorship program. Tonight on the show, we have the Chief Executive Officer of Rockshore International, Mr. Kwesio Furry. Now, we've got university students here in our midst. If you've got any question for Mr. Kwesio Furry, kindly raise up your hand. We'll pass the microphone over. You just uh, mention your name, introduce yourself, let's know where you're coming from, and then you ask your question. All right, uh, you've got the first question, okay. Okay. Um, good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Charlotte Tebia Isiyama. I'm from KNUST. So my question is, how do you set up a business when you don't have enough resources, but still you have passion to be an entrepreneur? All right, you want to take that? Yes. Yeah, go ahead. Yes. Uh, <coughs> my... My dear lady, uh, it, it, it's very uh, difficult to start a business without any resources. But you see, the, when you talk about resource, what do you mean? We have about three types of resource. We have the, the, remember, the human, the, the, uh, the capital, and also the ideas itself. And I mean, most often than not, here, and I mean the young ones, the, the, what is amiss is really the, uh, the idea itself. People try to photo, uh, I mean, to, to copy other people's ideas. An idea that doesn't come from you, no matter how much money that you put in, is somebody's idea. You can never be like that person. So before you even start talking about um, uh, resource, you have to think about these three things, the human, the, uh, the idea itself, and also uh, uh, I think the capital comes very, very, very uh, distant. So you have to think through it before you even go about it. Next question. I'll take a gentleman. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. My name is Paul Agbo. Um, we see young Ghanaians. Which university? AUCC. Okay. We see young Ghanaians engage in illegal mining in Galamse, and you are into mining. How are? How can we uh, empower these youth to enter full-scale um, mining so that we can have a lot of local content in the mining instead of just engaging in small-scale mining. Yes. Uh, thank you, Paul. Um, that's one of my favorite areas when it comes to 
Job. illegal mining. Uh, it's destroying our country. And uh, because I work in the mines, I travel a lot in these areas. And I can tell you what we see out there, it may, I mean, frighten you if you see it. Um, then again, I think our young ones uh, also need to, uh, to be employed. But hey, let me tell you, I believe that uh, there is so much in this country for everybody can get his or her share in this country. If only the private sector is really, really, really working the way it's supposed to work. Because for me, one thing I know is that government have no business in doing business. Government have no business in doing business. Government's main uh, uh, business is to support. An enabling environment. Exactly. And uh, sometimes also uh, uh, it's not coming. Paul, you come out from university right now, you get a job. First thing they tell you, you don't have five years experience. Fine, you get a job. And then you want to marry, you want to have your own accommodation. You go, they tell you to pay two years advance. These are things that will not help the young ones. You, you think the system is making it difficult for young people to thrive? I don't, I wouldn't say the system. Uh, the system, when you say the system, it means that I'm going to put the blame on the, on the government or so. What I'm trying to no, say is that... the system has always been with us. It's not been with us. And our... Uh, 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 sometimes, before we even get there, we ask ourselves, uh, as individuals, what we really want. For me, in my own small way, I think a lot of the young ones that have been with me, you, you can go around there and ask the people from uh, Rockshaw or Edmark or the other companies, they, they will tell you that I encourage uh, um, each one of them, if you are getting salary, please try and get your own place. You know, I always try to, you know, encourage them to do something. My point here is that you don't need to go and do garamse before you can make it. You don't. You don't. Because it's something that you dig today, tomorrow it won't be there. So you, I mean, we are going to dig ourselves to the end of the world. So there are so many things that we can do, but the, the, the environment has to be conducive for all of us when it comes to the, uh, the employment uh, issues. You've talked about your belief in the Ghanaian, the, the yes. capacity, the ability of the Ghanaian to, to work hard and to succeed. Uh, in the area within which you operate, which is in the mining industry, it's largely dominated by multinationals. And we've always said, governments have said that we need Ghanaians, we need local people to take up the commanding heights of industry. Is it ever going to be possible? I, um, Chrissy, I think that uh, we need to do a lot there. Uh, we want to demystify the myth about mining. These guys come to our country, we give them our concessions on silver platter, and then they give the contracts to uh, uh, their kinsmen who comes here. A job that will cost 100 million, they tell us it costs about 200 million. Until they recoup this kind of investment, Ghana government is not going to get what it deserves. Meanwhile, you go to these mining companies, they are Ghanaians who are doing the job. They bring uh, an expert engineer here. He takes home about three, four times what the Ghanaian who is doing the job takes. Kwesi was saying, for I have, I mean, I mean, come to the point that now it is our time. Now we are doing the mining for them. We do A to Z of the mining. And I tell you what. Uh, just January this year, we were working for one of our major clients. We were there with uh, one uh, very big uh, uh, mining contractor, an expert company. So between that company and Rockshaw, it was like David and Goliath. Then the client said they want only one contractor to be there. 
because we have done work for them for four years. They uh, they know our cap uh, I mean our capacity and everything. And track record. Our track record, our safety record. So there was no need to convince them anything. No. It was only about commercial. And we won the contract. Five years. We started first um, first January this year. So now we have come to a point that uh, now they know us. They know our, I mean, our capability. And the day that it was announced in their home country, I mean, they are, they are, I mean they're losing one. Their share value dropped $100 million for, for them to lose that contract to a, a local company, uh, I mean, uh, as Rockshaw. So now we are, uh, we are now moving. We have shown to the, to the international community that whatever they can do, we can also do. And we are doing it. We are delivering. The Ghanaian is capable. Yes, more than capable. Please, show him some love. So you have a combined workforce of about a thousand. How do you recruit? Oh, well, uh, normally I don't... What do you look out for? Uh, yeah, what I look out for, I personally don't get myself involved in this. As I said earlier, from procurement, uh, recruitment, and whatever, I'm not part of it. But of course, when you started the job, before you formalized it, yes. you handpicked people to work. Oh, with. yes, I did. I, 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 I did. And uh, for me, uh, again, uh, I, I look at your qualification, yes, but it's not the only factor. I look at you mean the qualification percent. is not the single most important factor? No, 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 no. So what you can do. And how do you know what he can do, he or she can do? Well, the person comes, you put him on probation, and if somebody is, uh, some of us, I mean, we are blessed to at least to, 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 to know uh, somebody who is serious, and, I, mean, I mean, the one who is not. And who, if the person is not serious, the way I am, within one or two weeks, you will leave. Because I always get to the office before you come. And I'm the last person to leave the office. So you cannot come there and, you know, just do whatever you want. Yes, for watching Time with the Captains, your monthly business mentorship program live here on TV3. Our guest for the month of July is the Chief Executive Officer of Rockshaw International, Mr. Kwesio Fori. We're going to take a short break. When we return, I'll ask him what he makes of the African youth and what the future of the African youth is. Stay tuned. <laughs> All right, thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome back to your monthly business mentorship program, Time of the Captains, live here on TV3, and our guest for the month of July is the Chief Executive Officer of Edmark, as well as um, uh, Rockshore International, Mr. Kwesi Ofori. Uh, just before we went on the break, I was asking you about what you make uh, of the future um, of the African uh, youth, and then I'll go back to our audience to take some more questions. Yeah, thank you, Kwesi. Talking about African youth, I cannot talk about African youth, but I can talk about the Ghanaian youth. Please do. I think uh, with uh, all these travels to most of these African countries, I've never seen any country in Africa that have the kind of uh, 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 social and uh, educational uh, know how like the Ghanaian youth. The Ghanaian youth is more matured and much more uh, willing to, to, to learn something than most of these countries. I believe that uh, the private sector should be given some kind of, uh, uh, you know, how many youth that you employ in your company, the government can even give you certain tax breaks, depending on the, uh, the number of uh, youth that you bring in. The, the, it's been done in other countries, you know, to entice uh, these businesses to bring in the young ones. Because the young ones are our future. And end of the day, 
somebody going to university doing his masters and all these things and come sit home not working it's a problem and the most dangerous person on earth is a, the learned uh, person who turned his energy into, into to something negative. What do you think is a problem? Some have said it's the, the kind of edu education we have here in our part of the world. Do you blame it on our education? Uh, education? I, I'm not an expert in that. I don't want to comment on something. No, but that you have traveled extensively mm -hmm. and you've seen how other people, your you know, educational systems is. Um, is there a challenge with our particular one? Does it focus too much on the theoretical? Yeah, yeah there is a problem here. Um, the little I can say is that we don't give much uh, importance to vocational education and technical education. Uh, excuse me if I'm wrong. Uh, most people will go into vocational education or technical education as their second choice. And here in Ghana, for instance, you bring in a, a carpenter to fix your door for you, you and we have to more or less <laughs> lift the, I mean, the door when you are closing it. You bring a painter to paint your house for you, your glasses are also painted. <laughs> because people don't get the formal education when it comes to this kind of things. And it's a warring. In Germany and other European countries, you know, somebody is a carpenter or a mason or whatever, his job is as good as you who is sitting in the office. You understand? So I think it's high time we make we this, on the uh, yeah, this vocational aspect. and the technical education attractive to students who are uh, first class students also to get into that. Because any first class student in Ghana wants to be a medical doctor, wants to be a lawyer, and I, I, in fact, I'm yet to meet one first class student uh, I mean, who tell me that he wants to be a carpenter. I haven't met one yet. And there's nothing wrong with it? There's nothing wrong with it. Because over there in Europe, a carpenter or mechanic, or sometimes they are even paid more than you sitting in the office. So I think... My, my final question before um, I, go, I go back to the student. So, we both know that, that you know, money is quite expensive here in Ghana. Yeah. But there are... And I know that, you know, you've contributed a lot in terms of employment. You've created employment opportunities for thousands of people. Yeah. But we also know that there are lots of people out there with brilliant ideas who are startups and who want to, you know, expand their businesses. What are people like you doing to support them? Elsewhere, we've got the angel investors, you know, who are there to, you know, take up interest and, you know, support these young ones. What are businessmen in Ghana doing? Yeah, I... I Last time we were discussing this thing, uh, sometimes I feel like um, I'm a bit, I mean, more than say, I mean, a crazy man, you know, because what makes me happy, for instance, what makes me happy is to see that I have my, I have a lot of workers. I wish I have about one million workers. Not because I'm rich or anything, but at least they have something to do. And I always thank God that through me, me, of I mean, man from no solid background, people are getting their food on the table through me, okay? And instead of building houses, instead of doing all these kind of things, I'm not saying that houses are not good, I haven't said so, but uh, what I'm trying to say is that one or two houses may be enough. Building <laughs> tens of houses are rather open uh, new business so that other people too can... Uh, Get job, and you see, I'm sure you're quite aware about you know Europe where we have venture capitalists, you know all about the Fortune 500 companies and all the contributions. Yes, the venture capital that you're talking about. Again, you have government. I mean, going that line, we saw what is happening with that one. Now. I quite agree with you. The business people come together; they could do something like that. You could set up a fund, for instance. A fund, but the point is that who is going to start? Who is you going to start? You've started if no one starts it. Well, that's another, another question. We mm. think about it. But for me, I believe that um, you cannot reinvent the wheel. It's there. We all have to continue with that. But let's make it attractive by opening new businesses without, you know, 
getting uh, a bit frustrated. You believe we're sitting on a time bomb with an increase in rates of unemployment in our country? Oh, sure, I do. I do. Uh, you see, over there in Europe, that they have a welfare system that they give people money for not working. It's not that they, they, they just like them. That's why they are giving the money. No. They do that to mitigate crime so that those who have really worked can enjoy their money. <laughs> okay? Else you can't sleep. Yeah, yes, else you can't sleep. But here, you know, somebody have all these kind of things and people around him are all hungry. I'm not, uh, I'm not here fighting for, uh, uh, for anybody, but my point is that let's do the right thing. If God has blessed you with something, open up. Open business so that others too can also. A round of applause for him, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> now I can take some more questions from you. Yes, I see a hand up there. Your name, uh, your institution, and then you. Who has a microphone? My name is Abdul Rashid Issa, a student of the Ghana Institute of Journalism. My question is considering the number of companies you are operating, what or how will you affirm or disagree with the saying that one cannot kill two bears with one stone? Yeah, I will. Um, yeah, thank you. You can't kill uh, two bears with, uh, I mean, with one stone. Sometimes I can also say that uh, five plus five is ten, but five times five is twenty-five. You're talking about uh, the multiplication here. Um, I personally have two companies that I am 100% uh, uh, I have 100% ownership in it. That's Edmark and uh, Rockshaw. The other companies, people have ideas, they come, and I invest in it. And I may even have majority shares in that company. And uh, uh, so, so you the company take equity in the business. Exactly. Mm. The company is running. I'm involved in it. So it's not me killing uh, two birds with one stone. If and I know you're killing five with one stone. <laughs> I mean, right now, I'm killing uh, two. That's 100%. And then mm. other three, that is, uh, I mean, uh, I'm in partnership mm. with others. Yeah. Mm. Next question. Yeah. Um, I'm Lydia. So and can you pass a microphone to the other side? I want one, one microphone to the other side. Right, so you pass your microphone to the other side. Yeah, sure. Yeah. I'm Lydia Asari from mm. the Ghana Institute of Journalism. Right. Um, I want to ask, what advice will you give to someone who is schooling and still want to work or s to set up a business? Like, what is the possibility that this person will not lose concentration while I was in school? Thank you. Right. Yeah, Lydia, thank you. Uh, I think the best, uh, the best system probably is you work and you school. I mean, that's the best uh, combination. In fact, when I was young, the energy was there, you know. The energy was there, and sleeping just four hours a day, five hours a day was, even three hours was enough for me. I was schooling and I was working. And in fact, when you have that, you are always on your toes. And you, I mean, the, 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 I mean, the mind is always active. And I, I don't think you lose concentration if you have a job. Of course, it also depends on the kind of job that you are talking about. But most of the time, if you are schooling, you can't really do a very, very heavy job. It's be some side uh, trading or things like that. Mm. You've told, I mean, in our private conversations, you've told me about the your mother's contribution to your life. I mean, yeah. she was quite integral uh, in your upbringing. What, what sort of impact did she have on you? Yes. That old lady, um, you know, my father died when I was only really nine years old. So my mom was my, my mother, my uncle, my father, uh, my everything. And she was solid. When I say solid. You she describe your mom as solid? Yeah, she will beat you. She, she will really beat you if you because for her you know she I mean, she's alone so i mean you will really really have to follow her instructions and this had a lot of impact on me in fact uh, 
for me to go home, even though I was in my 20s, to go home with a, a woman, no, 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 my mom was there, I can't do that. You know, I just couldn't do that. Not that, uh, no. The only woman that my mom saw. Is your wife now? My wife. <laughs> and she approved of it? She saw her and she just embraced her. She said, you are my heart. All right, I'll take a s final question, 20 seconds. Yeah, the lady there. Okay, okay. you go ahead. You go ahead. Yeah, my name is Gloria Apre. I'm a student of Wisconsin University. My question is um, that in running your companies, has there ever been a time where you hit rock bottom and felt that you, you have failed? All right, thank you. And um, how did you bounce back thank you, from thank that? Thank you, thank you, thank you. Yes, in fact, I don't think there's any human being in this world who haven't reached that rock bottom before. But they always say that it's darkest when it's about to, to be a daybreak. Uh, yes, there have been a lot of times that, uh, in fact, I've, I've had more lows than uh, highs. But I believe in my God and I believe in myself. These are two things. And um, he has never forsaken me. I, I'm, when it comes to these things, I'm very, 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 very hard on it. A round of applause, ladies and gentlemen, for Mr. Kwesi Okori, the Chief Executive Officer of Edmark and Rockshaw International. And just to inform you that Saturday happens to be his 60th birthday. And a day before that, a day before that, which is Friday, is the 25th anniversary of Rockshaw International. Edmark. Edmark, 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 right, one of his companies. Yeah. So congratulations, sir, and thank you very much. Yes. We're indeed proud of you. Yes. And uh, we say um, all the best. God continue to bless you thank for you. all that you do. Thank you very much. Okay. Yeah, and, thank and you. it will be uh, Rockshaw's 10 years anniversary. Also. Rockshaw will be 10 years. Yes. Rockshaw is 10 years, and Edmark, Edmark is 25, 25 years, years, and you are 60 years. 60 years. A round of applause for ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> And we're going to celebrate that, right? Yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah, sure. <laughs> okay, so thank you very much for watching Time with the Captains, our monthly business mentorship program. Sorry, for the month of July. My name is Park Wissi. Sorry, thanks very much for watching. Our guest has been the Chief Executive Officer of Rockshaw International and Edmark, Mr. Kwesio Fori. Uh, hopefully, same time next month, we'll come your way with yet another program. Stay tuned and bye bye. We've got News 360 coming up shortly. You guys got it. Tides of the maker. Yeah. Slumber waker. Don't you give up. No matter what comes your way. Believe in the God that you serve. Don't you give up when troubles come your ways Cause it's training you for the better All the problems you're going through The storm will soon be over 